Hi, I'm Kate Kunau. I'm the curator of collections and exhibitions at the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art. And welcome to One Night Stand, Gigi Simmons and Winter and Impressionism. Today, we're going to discuss one of my favorite paintings currently on view at the CRMA, George Gardner Simmons's Winding Stream from around 1920. It's an oil painting on canvas that the CRMA purchased in 1920 with money from the Van Vechten Fund, so we must have purchased it fairly fresh off the easel. It's currently on view in the first gallery on the ground floor. You can see here it has a beautiful frame as well. Uh, so we're going to start and look at some details. This is obviously the entire piece. And here we have some beautiful detail shots where you can see all of the different colors that he gets into this winter scene. Uh, I love the bright yellow and red house in the upper left hand corner. Some more detail shots. You can see lots of blues and grays and browns in his snow, some light purples, dots of pure white. And of course, the titular stream has lots of pale greens and purples, uh, some bright reds. So it's a really striking piece uh, with a lot of different colors to it, which you wouldn't naturally think of um, in a winter scene. We don't know an overwhelming an amount about the artist of this work, who's popularly known as Gigi Simmons. Uh, most of what I was able to gather came from his obituary in the New York Times, the headline of which we see here. George Gardner Simmons, seen here, uh, was an American Impressionist painter. He was born in either 1861 or 1863 in Chicago, Illinois. Although the former date of 1861 is the more repeated one and the one we use at the museum. Attending the School of the Art Institute in Chicago, Simmons also studied in Europe and won awards at the National Academy of Design and the Corcoran Gallery of Art. He was a plein air painter who built his first studio in the art colony of Laguna Beach, California in the early 1900s. At the time of his death in 1930, he was regarded as one of the nation's leading landscape painters. He had contracted an illness after one of his trips to Europe that culminated in pneumonia and passed away at the home of his brother-in-law, A.M. Trerov. Uh, of course, they give the address because it's <laughs> the early 1900s at 61 Williamson Avenue in Hillside, New Jersey at the age of 64. And his body was taken back to Chicago for burial. For burial. Uh, Mr. Simmons had lived for several years at the studio apartment building of the National Arts Club was the winner of many art prizes and did much of his work in his country home of Coleraine, Massachusetts, where he specialized in winter landscapes. And we see examples of his other winter landscapes here. And I'll talk a little bit more in more depth about a few of these in just a moment. So he was best known for his winter landscapes, but he does also do other scenes. Here are three examples here. Uh, he also went to Europe every year to paint. As previously mentioned, he first studied at the Chicago Art Institute and later at the Art Institutes of Paris, London, and Munich. Today, his principal works are The Winter Sun, which is now in the Chicago Art Institute, and The Opalescent River in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. In 1910, he won the Carnegie Prize of the National Academy of Design, the Evans Prize of the Salmagundi Club, and a bronze medal of the Buenos Aires Exposition. The National Arts Club in 1912 conferred a gold medal and prize of $1,000 for this painting, The Sun's Glow and Rising Moon. In that same year, Mr. Simmons also won the third Corcoran medal, and the next year he received the Saltus Gold Medal and another medal in the 1914 Dallas, Texas show. So winter scenes are a favorite of Simmons, and he produced dozens over the course of his career. In the broader scope of Impressionism and general art history, however, winter landscapes are much more rare. Let's take a look into the few artists that also tackled winter landscapes. Monet did about 140 paintings of snow, but they represent just a very small fraction of his work. This is The Road to Giverny in Winter from 1883, a mid-career work for Monet before the extreme abstraction of his light style, but with the abundance of color characteristic of his fully developed Impressionism. 
And here we can see just like Simmons, Monet uses a lot of blues and grays and lavenders and browns in his winter scene. Uh, so it seems like these paintings would be very dull and just white, but of course that's not the case. The magpie, which is today one of the most popular paintings in Paris's Musée d'Orsay, is one of Monet's earliest snow paintings. Uh, from this work, we can trace how much his, he changed as his Impressionist style developed. He painted the Magpie in 1868 through 69, before the first Impressionist exhibition of 1873. The public was not used to white paintings, and this work was rejected by the Salon of 1869. Uh, the way Monet created the Magpie as the focal point in the composition reveals his genius, leading our eye to the bird through contrast and repeated lines of movement in the fence's shadows. The brushwork is masterful, although this is a masterpiece of Monet's early style, which is more realist than Impressionist. Uh, so it's really different to compare this early work with his mid-career piece. We can see a lot of stylistic change uh, in amount of use, use of paint on the brush. Uh, the brush strokes themselves get a lot shorter and more numerous. Uh, so it's a really interesting comparison to make. By 1880, Monet's paintings were gradually becoming more and more abstract. He was less concerned with structure, depth, and perspective. The paintings become more about color, pattern, and vibration, which is what we see here in Floating Ice Near Vertoil. Lots of blue, deep blue greens, purples, and powder blue for the sky. Nearly half the painting is a reflection in the water, something he takes to full abstraction in his water lily paintings later. As time goes on, even Monet's snow scenes begin to take on more colors. This was allowed in the 19th century, this expanded palette, uh, because painters could buy their paints in tubes for the first time, which allowed them to paint more easily outside. In many paintings, snow and ice become less dominated by white and gray and appear to be dusted with all colors of the rainbow. Monet's Grain Stacks is a series of about 25 paintings that include several snow scenes, two of which we see here, uh, which offer a good comparison if we see them as Monet intended. And so again, we have all these different colors. We have pale yellows and browns, blues, purples, grays. Uh, so we are really getting into all the different colors of the rainbow, even in these ostensibly totally white paintings. In 1895, Monet traveled to Norway and painted landscapes in the palest of colors. This is from Sandviken, Village in the Snow, 1895. It's apparent that Monet's interest in spatial depth, so, e so easily seen in earlier paintings, is gone, and overlapping shapes are the only forms to give dimension of space. Uh, I particularly love this one with its pops of red, which feel very Scandinavian to me, alongside the blues and greens and purples. Uh, so he's really expanded his snowy palette. In the 1886 novel Swa, Paula Dam describes an exchange between a painter called Vibrac and a rich conservative woman named Martha Grelou. Vibrac, whose character Adam, based on the Impressionist painter Camille Pizarro, who we'll get to in a moment, expands his radical vision for painting. As he paints snow from a veranda, Martha sees him reaching for colors other than white and accuses him of rich exaggeration. The Brock responds, when I look at snow, I see pinks and lilacs in the shadows and these shades are everywhere. The Brock's response brings to mind the small painting painted by Pizarro from his studio window in the village of Erani sur Epte in Northern France, where he lived for 20 years before his death in 1901. If you look closely at snowy landscape at Noragny with an apple tree, you'll struggle to find much pure white. Despite the luminous tone across the picture, like the even glow of light hitting virgin snow, the colors, pure and mixed, vary hugely. From the yellow of the sun and its reflections on the snow in the meadows to the violet and earthy green branches of the most prominent tree, the gray-blue of distant buildings and the spire in the small village of Bazincourt, to the pinks and lilacs and patches across the picture from foreground to sky, Pizarro creates tremendous chromatic subtlety from just a few tubes of paint. He has seemingly relished painting out in the snow in his earlier years. 
Uh, his first forays into wintry scenes were at the turn of the 1870s, where he and Monet stood together just in front of his house in the Parisian suburb of Lovosien and made paintings of the road to Versailles. Wherever he went, Pizarro relished the chance to paint snow, and winter scenes were also popular with his collectors. A year after painting Snowy Landscape, he wrote to Lucien, my paintings are advancing. I have eight things going and I am waiting impatiently for snow. Another reason he, Pizarro and Monet may have relished painting winter scenes were the Japanese prints that were such a cornerstone of the Impressionist movement, many of them evocatively picturing snow. And we see four examples here. Pizarro was as effusive as many of his peers, including Monet. He described the 1893 exhibition of 300 prints by Hiroshiga and Utamaro at Duran Bruel's Paris Gallery as admirable, adding, quote, Hiroshige is a marvelous impressionist. Modet, Rodin, and I are enthusiastic about the show. I am pleased with my effects of snows and floods. These Japanese artists confirm my belief in our vision. And so here are four different Hiroshige prints um, of winter that would have been in that show and inspired both Pizarro and Monet. Snowy landscape evokes the elegance and graphic power of those Japanese prints in the overall simplicity of the composition and in those curving branches of the central apple tree, which appears to almost dance in the breeze. Monet and Pizarro were two of the only Impressionists who devoted time to winter scenes but as their influence grew and the Impressionist movement moved from France to the United States, artists like Simmons took up the Impressionist mantle and created masterpieces from this seemingly unlikely time of year. Masterpieces like the Cedar Rapids Museum of Arts, Winding Stream. Thank you.